Uh, dear uh, Facebook uh, Pure Urology viewers, good evening one and all. Uh, today an important day uh, for me as well as for the Pure group. Uh, today we are discussing about the RIRS in children. Uh, overall, as you all know that endoscopic management of the stone disease constitutes nearly 50% of the urology work uh, anywhere in the world by urologists, whether you practice it or not you are to be involved with it. Uh, not many will document, not many will analyze, not many will come out with uh, some conclusions. If not, the science might have not developed to this level. We all see the AUA guidelines, EAU guidelines and the European guidelines, various other guidelines. There should be one or some persons who has to contribute for that. If somebody says I have done thousand surgeries, it has no value. If somebody says that I have done 300 surgeries but this is my observation and authentically proved in a paper that has more value as you all know. So over a period of time the science is evolved based on the evidence. This is evidence based medicine. One uh, professor who has dedicated his entire career for research and education is today our speaker Professor Bhaskar Somani. I am surprised when I am reading the CV today and uh, when I have seen me, my family was seeing the photo, they told that he is too young to achieve what is his age, they asked. But I, I said that is not the thing. The day probably he might have entered UK, he had vision and uh, continuously, uh, continuously worked hard for the same vision that uh, uh, publishing the work, doing research, educating the people. Very few will have all the mix along with the live surgeries. So let me ask few questions to sir before I officially introduce and hand over the program. Sir, Bhaskar sir, good evening. I will take two minutes to briefly know your career because it is fantastic career, one, one's dream. Uh, sir, when did you uh, uh, join the urology? Who was your mentor? Uh, Dr. Chandman, Wadi, first of all, thank you so much for a very kind invite. It is a real pleasure for me to be associated and join. You are doing fantastic work yourself, both in adult and children. And uh, your success story is also very inspirational. And secondly, please call me as Bhaskar. I'm junior to you and you have achieved a lot yourself. So please don't call me sir. Sorry. So from, from my side, I, I came to UK immediately after doing my MBBS in 1999-2000. Uh, oh, Great. And since then, uh, because I hadn't done any higher degree in India, it was slightly difficult initially because it's easier when you've done an MS or an MD or something like that. Sir. Uh, and then, so, and, and then I started in a, in different, different jobs, uh, long journey, but last 10 years have been really good and all the fruits of research and making it practical based research. So I don't, I'm not very good in lab-based research. I'm not very, you know, good at that. I've never enjoyed that. I've enjoyed clinical research. And if you enjoy clinical research and you can do both the clinical side and publish it, there is nothing like it. And I think that's what uh, has made uh, things, you know, possible. Who was your mentor in the career? See, most of the UK, even my colleagues are there. Those who are, uh, who come and they, they have a habit of writing the paper and documenting it. What is the difference in education between there and here, honestly, I want to ask. Are you trained in statistics? Are you are your bosses help you in writing the papers initially? Yeah, one thing I will tell you, there is nothing like ambition and self-drive. If you have ambition and self-motivation, and you're a lot of, I mean, most Indians, and not just Indian, most people work hard. That's why you achieve. But how do you tailor the hard work into channelizing it into a way that becomes more fruitful? And a lot of what most people in UK and everywhere else do is self-driven. So nobody will tell you do this and do that. Most of these ideas, most of the papers, of course, you need people to supervise you. Because when I started writing in the beginning, I wasn't writing very fluently. It comes with time. Similarly, in the beginning, when you're a junior, you don't have so many ideas. That comes with time. But I think a lot of it is how driven you are and where you want to go and mixing it with hard work in the right way sir last question before i officially introduce you sir if you wanted to 
uh, like you to encourage the Indian urologists who are doing massive work, uh, how they should uh, at least collaborate uh, with one senior who can guide and uh, help in see the predominant part, honest part in India is that they in private practitioners, even those who are doing volumes, they never focus on documenting the findings and the follow. So yeah. can there be some uh, some leaders for every hundred group who are doing more than more than hundred surgeries is a big number, but many urologists does it. Let it be URSL, RIRS, PCNL, but it is high volume. And is there anything can be done where the regular training, not the not the statistics, not the p value, but how practically we can put up the forms to fill up and then put that into the statistician's mind and then small regular follow-ups not like 10 years follow-up at least three months follow-up what we have to see at least in stone stone work maybe in the next uh, talk if you can give it to us it will have a great help and people of like course. you can motivate uh, the indians to do more research work of course so i in fact, in my discussion, I have I will share one paper which I collaborated with uh, Dr. Madhu Agarwal in Agra, yes, and you will see that paper in the pediatric one. So I have always thought, you know, in career, in life, you know, you need to, first of all, do your surgeries well. Most people are trained in that. Yes. Secondly, be good, be good with the patients. Most people will do a decent job. I think the communication is a little bit, I learned a lot when I came to UK because the system here is, 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 is like that, you're exactly trained better. Correct. But where people lack is then the financial aspect comes in and the research aspect then sometimes gets overshadowed by practicalities of life, finance and so on. Even here in UK, for all my research, I don't get paid anything. You'll be surprised to know. So I'm a full-time clinician. Yeah, if I didn't do any research, my salary is not going to change at all. At all. Okay. Of course, the recognition and the... Yeah. You have to enjoy it, first of all. You have to enjoy it. So the, correct. So if somebody in India wants to do research, you have to make time for it. There is a... You will never be able to say... Uh, because all, all of... I mean, the volume is such. Everybody is busy. So you have to have time. And then you need to have a group with you that you can do together because individually you can only do so much if you had a good group around you and you share that work and personally i'll be very happy to collaborate with uh, you know most indians in big centers or doing some uh, niche work like yourself the important thing is the the data has to be good this is where people lack because people don't yes. maintain the data yes. so you need one data keeper who can maintain the data and you don't have to have every TURP or every ureteroscopy, but you need to have, you know, data on areas which are niche. So pediatric stones, for example, I, I started 10 years ago and I have kept my database prospectively since then. And you and, and you gradually learn where was the complication, how could you have done it better. So it helps not just for research, but also improving yourself. Yes, sir. So with this, I will uh, uh, officially introduce uh, Professor Bhaskar Somani and then uh, uh, hand over the program to because it's a li li limited time program uh, good evening everyone uh, already more than 50 people have joined uh, lot many will join he, uh, professor baskar somani is uh, uh, an endourologist with 20 years of experience he is the coordinator of the largest uh, simulation training for urology in the world this is the future because number of patients available to the doctors may not be as much as 20 years back now and in future he has published over 300 papers i index is 40 and rg score 47 and a further of one were 405 conference presentations not an easy task he's an editorial board of five journals he has been invited as speaker to perform live surgery and for moderations in more than 25 countries worldwide uh, he is an active member of boss that is bangladesh association of urology and urology subsection and it's the Wessex Clinical Research Network and Simulation Led for Urology. He's the president of Petra Group. This is a, an important group. Many of you know Progress in Endourology Technology and Research Association, an active member of European School of Urology Training and Research Group and EAU section of Eurotechnology. 
Besides endourology, his current research interests include diagnosis and management of urinary tract infections, stent and catheter related infections, use of artificial insulins and post-surgery quality of life. These are the neglected areas, purely neglected areas. We depend on antibiotics. We need to understand more unless somebody do research, we, can, we will not be able to enjoy. He is the advisor to National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, Interventional Committee and has been an invited expert to NICE Urological Infection Guidelines. For his work, he won the Regional NHS Emerging Leader Award in 2015 and EAU Section of Urolithiasis Annual Award 2017 and 2019. Arthur Smith Endo Urology Award for Surgeon in UK to win the Worldwide Award 2020. That is really great. We congratulate you for that, sir. Winner Clinical Research Award EAU Section of Urolithiasis 2019. Winner Best Paper in the Literature Award EAU Section of Urolithiasis 2017, that is ULIS. Joint Winner NSH Emerging Leader 2015, Finalist NHS Innovation Award 2014, Royal Society of Medicine Urology Section 2016. Only thing I did not like is your junior and 2019 finished and went. Rest of all the things, it is uh, really amazing. Uh, 2010 to 2020 is magnanimous year for a decade for you. I wish it will go further and you will reach more heights, sir. With this, I will uh, hand over the program of pediatric RIRS, which is a subject of uh, concern because it is technically demanding and you need to know uh, more. Maybe I will be the biggest beneficiary today because I also practice pediatric uh, RIRS. Thank you, sir, for the, uh, for the invitation, for the accepting the invitation. Over to you. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Chandmohan Wadi. Thank you, the Preeti Hospital, and to the uh, the new stream that you have created. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen now, and hope you can see it. So, just one small correction: the BAUS was the British Association of Urological Surgeons, oh, okay, but okay. I would be there. That's okay. I'll be very happy to be a part of the Bangladesh Association as well if that invite comes. Right. So. I'm uh, going to talk and share some of the ways uh, how the pediatric RIRS, how we started it, and uh, some insights into some of the papers we have published. But at any point, please feel free to, to stop me. These are some of my conflict of interest. So just going back. So EAU guidelines for urolithiasis, the, the new one, I'm on it. So a lot of what I talk will be uh, based on the EAU guidelines 2021. So let's look at the guidelines then. So according to the guidelines of pediatrics, you know, the, the indications are very similar to adult in terms of intervention. For urethral stones under one centimeter, generally speaking, lithotripsy is the option one and urethroscopy as an alternative depending on the center you are in. And for renal stones, again, lithotripsy as a first line with URS as an alternative. But of course, large stones, it's still PCNL. Uh, but in kids more than adults, I mean, it probably for both, but offer metabolic evaluation because it's very, very important in pediatric patients in terms of recurrence prevention and uh, to detect the stone types. So always make sure there is one stone analysis done. And what is the uh, evidence for RIRS of flexible electroscopy? You have good stone free rate. Retreatment rate is variable up to 20%. Complication rates can vary, but most of them are minor. They are especially useful for lower pole stones with unfavorable anatomy. And generally, the predisposing factors of failure are young patients, especially under the age of four or five, cysteine stones, large stones, and if they're not pre-stented. And compared to PCNL, the stone free rate is lower, but there's less radiation complication in hospital stay. We'll all agree with that. Yes. Now, worldwide, you know, the, the trend we know that the urethroscopy has increased, lithotripsy has come down. That's a phenomena we have seen everywhere. Uh, and UK is not unique. And I'm sure it's the same in India as well. Yes. And if you look at pediatric stone disease specifically, uh, there is more interest in minimally invasive PCNL and urethroscopy. And I know your team, Dr. Vadi, you do a lot of uh, uh, minimally invasive PCNL and urethroscopy also in the pediatric age group. So... This is something we are seeing increasingly uh, being done. And open surgery probably is almost obsolete in most parts of the world. Yes. Now, this is very important. Although this is a talk on IRS, I just want to emphasize, you must investigate any renal calculi in a, in a child. Uh, 
we only do ultrasound unless there is diagnostic dilemma if the if the patient's about 15 16 sometimes we'll do a ct scan but make sure that the ultrasonographer or the radiologist or if you're a urologist practice do you have more experience in it because it's easy sometimes to miss a calculi or to overdiagnose it and of course the metabolic evaluation has to be done now this paper probably sets the scene this is our experience of 100 year retroscopy uh, from the time i became a consultant in southampton uh, and that includes 81 patients and about 1.3 procedures per patient with a mean age of about nine years, but it ranged from one to 16 years. Uh, the stone size is variable, but about nine millimeters as a cumulative size. Most of them, three quarters were in the kidney and of which most were in the lower pool. So similar to adult, you know, sort of demographics, multiple stones in more than a quarter, pre stent in about a third. Usually it is because we receive patients from equivalent of about 350 kilometers or 300 kilometers around where we are. Sometimes they're stented in the parent hospital. Our pre-stenting rate for pediatric is probably between 5 and 10%. Usually we'll do primary URS. Uh, Post-op stent rates are also less than adults because I think pediatric patients, they expel the stones much easier than adults. Yes. Uh, stone-free rate between 73 and sec final stone-free rate of 99%. So one was not stone-free. Rest, everything, everyone was stone-free. And this is the important aspect. There were three complications. One was a sepsis who went to ICU, but they also had respiratory issues, two simple UTIs. And I think that's the key, that the complication rates in good high-volume endurology centers uh, uh, is, is quite low, and one patient needed readmission. So this, for me, it really turns the tide to, uh, against shockwave lithotripsy for pediatric patients because you need a general anesthetic anyway. You might as well do your retroscopy, which gives a better stone free rate and the complication rates, which are which are quite low. But do I do it alone? I don't do it alone. We have a model where myself and the pediatric urologist Steve Griffin, we do it together. So the pre-op counseling, uh, the MDT planning. So the counseling pre-op is done by Steve. We do the MDT planning together. We are together in the operating room. Then they go to the pediatric ward. And then uh, we, in the pediatric ward, you know, the specialist, they look after it. I'm not saying this is the only model, but for us, this model works really well because him and his team are more used to looking after kids. If there is a problem, identifying problems early on. Uh, in the operating room, as I said, we are together and the outcomes I've just shared. So I think this is a model a, a lot of, at least Western Europe, uh, especially in UK and around, they have kind of adopted where there is a, a twin surgeon model between adult and pediatric urologists. Uh, so uh, access sheet, I mean, there is always a, 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 you know, a dilemma. Should you be using access sheet? But should you be using it? It's a question of when should you be using it? And are you happy to use it? And I will show how I do it. But this is a recent paper between our center and the Spanish center. Uh, again, they are high volume and we had 48 patients and we looked at uh, the use of uh, access sheet. Uh, again, uh, the stone size, you know, the mean stone burden, one and a half centimeter plus, so reasonably high. And a lot of patients had multiple stones. Uh, if you look at the, the, the again, outcomes, Pre-op stent rate, post-op stent rates are what you would expect. Post-op stent rate, probably lower than what you'd expect. Initial and final stone free rate, final stone free rate, 100%. But some patients did need a second and sometimes, uh, you know, uh, occasionally a third. I think one patient needed a third procedure. Now, if you look at the, the injuries, we all dread about genetic injury with the excess sheet. But I tell you, in good hands, and when I say in good hands, I don't mean that we are good and that's why. I always do a semi-rigid ureteroscopy, even in pediatric and adult, before doing an access sheet. Because you can calibrate the ureter, you can see if the scope is going to go or an access sheet is going to go, and you do, then the, you, you're not going to injure and passively you dilate the ureter. Yeah. So uh, we, we had one minor injury, but that's it. And the complications were quite low. So I think this again shows that if you have, were treating larger stones, access sheet is not a bad adjunct to use. 
And what about long term? You know, we always worry, you know, that there will be stricter formation, especially in pediatric. This is from our central. This was published three years ago, I think. Again, use an access sheet and a mean follow up. So large stone size. I always use the smallest size that is available, which is for, her, for us, it's 9.5, 11.5. The problem is the digital scopes don't go in. So I use the Stodd's uh, reusable FlexX 2C or FlexX 2. Uh, for, for going in. And if you look at the, the length of follow-up, you know, it was mean follow-up of just over two years and there were no complications. Except one, everybody was stone-free. So again, uh, we document everything prospectively. The patients go home usually the next day, not same day because they have come from a distance. Very often, when it's a stent, I leave an open-ended urethric catheter rather than an actual stent. And a year through catheter, and that is taken out the following morning, and then they go home. Yeah. Uh, so this was the study I was talking about, where you know we're talking about collaborating with Indian centers. So me and Madhu we met in one of the conferences, and we were talking about pediatric patients and how they do mini PCNL and we do ureteroscopy. And I said, okay, let's compare the the outcomes of similar sort of uh, patients. So we had you know 55 and 40 patients. And the stone attributes, they're slightly higher stone size, but not significantly higher in the mini PCNL group. Uh, but we had more multiple stones in our group. Uh, if you look at the post-op stent, of course, with ureteroscopy, it was slightly higher than mini PCNL. The stone free rate eventually, you know, 100% versus 97.5, so no difference really. Complication rates were slightly higher with the mini PCNL, but I have to say there were minor complications. None of them are major complications. But statistically, the results were very similar. So it is not a question of which technique is better. It's a question of which technique you are familiar with and which techniques you your team you know is, is happy with. And that's what you should use. For us, we are more familiar with the ureteroscopy for pediatric patients. And in, in Madhu Center, they do more mini PCNL. Ultimately, it's the patient at the end of the, uh, of the road and they need to have good outcomes. And that's it. You can do it whichever way you like. This is one thing that that I think I will would like to stress. Six years seems to be a watershed. You know, less than six years, there is a much higher failure rate to access compared to more than six years, and the complication rates are also much higher. So less than six years, don't force. If you need to pre-stent, even for us, the pre-stent rates. If you look at before and after six years of age, it's it's different. So that is one thing that I would warn that if you have got patients who are really young, and I know, uh, Dr. Chandramohan, you do a lot of really small uh, patients as well. I, I think you'll agree that if you, you might need to pre stent and bring them back and don't try and uh, you yeah, know, do 100%. everything at once. 100%. Uh, this is lower pole stones. So, you know, we always say flexibility retroscopy for uh, adult lower pole stones. What about pediatric? This is a recent paper that's just going through uh, some uh, some uh, proofreading, but it's accepted in general fund urology. Again, we teamed up with the Spanish Center, and we had uh, 57 patients. Uh, when we look at the mean age, it was between 1 and uh, 16 years. Mean stone size, again, it ranged, but about 1 centimeter as an average. A uh, lot of patients having uh, multiple stones, more than 50%. Uh, stent rate similar to the other series, access sheet used in about uh, 42%. Again, stone free rate was very good. Now, I would accept low pull stone, 98%, even if you had to do some patients with uh, a second surgery. That's actually, it's not a bad, uh, bad outcome. Complications were all UTI, not sepsis, treated with uh, antibiotics for a few days. So again, for, for lower pool stones, even in the pediatric, I think we will see gradually a shift in the guidelines. And I think probably RIRS will come up to SWL uh, in terms of the choice rather than just behind SWL. Yeah. Now, this is uh, the smaller scoop, and this was published from Nadia. And I think this, this 7.5 will change the way we do pediatric scoops. That's why I put this study, because... I think in terms of vision, in terms of maneuverability, they are similar. I've used uh, the 7.5 for adult cases, and I'm going to start using for pediatric cases. But essentially, 
you know, there was no difference by using smaller than bigger, uh, bigger scope. I think the only difference is you can put it to a smaller access sheet and probably it will increase the rate of primary electroscopy as opposed to, you know, pre-stenting because the smaller scope will allow you to do that. Uh, this is something I don't practice. This is from the Spanish colleagues who I've collaborated with. They do totally fluoroless uh, intranasal surgery. I have to say, when I'm using an access sheet, I really like to see, especially at the U, U, uh, UO and at the top in the UPJ, that it's in place. I'm not comfortable not having at least, I don't screen it. I use one flash and one flash. And at the end for the stent, I just use one flash to check it is in place. Yes. Maybe you can do it fluoroless. I don't know, but I find... I can sleep better by at least three yeah. or four flush and that's it. Yes. Uh, but, they, but they do it and they say that you can have it as a backup. You don't need to do it. You know, it's something probably debatable. And I think maybe if you are really good in ultrasound, you can do an ultrasound. But actually, it's not easy when you've got so many things. Patient is draped doing an ultrasound to check things. So this, uh, I'm, I'm the coordinator for the Europe hands-on training. And we have looked at how should we train people? You know, what is the best way of training for endourology? And this is what we say. Always, always do rigid cystoscopy and safety wire. I know you can do directly rigid electroscopy. I know you can just do a wire placement and do a, a railroad or a wireless electroscopy. I can do all of that. But this is how you should train people. Rigid cystoscopy, safety wire, semi-rigid electroscopy. In every single case, I do it. Put a working guide where or a second guide where then if you need an access sheet, you can put it and then a flexible electroscopy. You can argue and say you waste time. It doesn't take very long, three or four minutes, maybe three minutes to do a semi-rigid if you are doing it regularly because the team knows that's what is going to happen. But it allows you to passively dilate it. And the advantage is maybe one or two, once or twice I have said we need this access sheet. It has not got, gone in. But most of the time, because you have calibrated the unit, you can see which size access sheet will go in. You don't waste an access sheet because you'll open it and it will go in because you've, you've done it. Uh, combination of, uh, you know, Flexi ORS and uh, mini PCNL in pediatric, I haven't done it, but I think it's like an ISRIS and it should be possible. Uh, this is a series that was published and I think I quite like the concept. Similar to adults, you can do uh, an ISRIS in, in this. Uh, they had five minor complications, and I think maybe this will be taken up more for multiple calculi, you know. But I think electroscopy probably does a similar job in my mind, unless it's a really big stone for which you need to do a PCNL. Yes. Uh, this is, again, something very important. You know, it, does it have to be a very high volume center? And we looked at, you know, dif dividing the volumes. And we defined medium volume centers who had done 25 to 50 or 49 cases. And actually, the evidence showed, and high volume is more than 50 cases, that electroscopy was safe in both medium and high volume centers. Now, the question is not about the center. It's also about the surgeon. If in a center, five people are doing it, clearly, their experience is divided. So I think you should have one, maybe two people maximum. In our center, I'm the only one who does the the the, the yeah. electroscopy flexi URS part who is then who, who then gains the experience who then becomes better and I'm sure the the, the, the outcomes are reflective of that. This is something uh, large stone electroscopy. It's always controversial, isn't it? Do you do PCNL? We looked at a preliminary series of 18 patients with stone sizes between one and six and a half centimeter, and okay, the stone free rate was not you know, comparable to PCNL, but it was 89%. And I would say probably it was not bad. Uh, and patients went home uh, the next day and there were no complications. So it is possible to do large stones. And how do I do it? Uh, this is something that I use a high power laser usually if I have and use dusting and pop dusting. And we have published that, uh, including a video of, uh, so start with dusting and doing the outer layer and then change it into pop dusting mode. So the dusting usually is the setting as shown, 0 0.5 to 0 point, 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 joules, and then followed by pop dusting. And that actually gives a very good, uh, good result. I know people are worried about the temperature inside and whatever. To be honest, I haven't seen any, any impact of that. 
because you're not continuously doing it for many minutes. You will do it and sometimes wait for the vision to clear and do again. So there's always the temperature balance uh, in between. And again, we had we had good results with, with this for pediatric stones. So I started doing pediatric stones uh, about, sorry, <clears throat> 10 years ago and from I can't do it because I was very nervous when I first started doing it and actually scared because you know you only need to have one or two big complications and you are in trouble so how do I do it always urine culture and up-to-date ultrasound imaging antibiotic prophylaxis absolutely a must cystoscopy safety wise semi-rigid we have a needle scope from Wolf 4.5 French it's beautiful I suggest if you're going to do pediatric work you should have really have this scope access sheet if if you have and i think increasingly i'll be using the smaller scope uh, the 7.5 french keep the irrigation pressure and i think the timing is important don't try and do it for a very long time stage it if you need to uh post-op overnight ureteric catheter or stent if you if you whatever you're happy with uh and i think the small ureteroscope allow less pre-stenting less primary urs less post-op stenting and probably higher success. So I think the smaller scopes will probably be increasingly used uh, in pediatric patients. Uh, and, and if it's single use, I, I know it's single use or multi single use, but yeah, whatever. But I think smaller scopes will be become more popular. I, I, I have used this and I, I, I think it's quite, quite good. And the vision deflection is quite good, similar to the adult scope. Thank you so much. Great. I'm very happy to let's discuss some questions and yes. whatever else. Uh, uh, I, uh, I will uh, ask some question. Uh, somebody is asking, I, uh, one question asked by the audience is that Nitin uh, Gargil, uh, his close friend of mine, he is asking smaller length flexible scope, is it available? Uh, and uh, smaller luminal, already you mentioned that 7.5 is the world's smallest flexible scope. And smaller length, uh, do you have experience? Uh? To be honest, I've the smaller length rigid electroscope is available. Yes. Flexible electroscope, as far as I know, it's not. But realistically, you don't need a smaller length. Yes. Because even when you are doing the, even if it's a young, young, young patient, let's say two, three year old, yeah. the length of the ureter, in my view, is very similar to an adult. Once you're in the kidney, you don't realize it's a yes. pediatric or adult. Yes. So I don't think you need a smaller length electroscope. What I would say is you have to be very careful in the pediatric, especially males, that you do a gentle urethral dilatation before right. putting scopes, etc. But uh, I'm not sure you need a smaller length scope. Yes, sir, uh, about my observation less than five years, if you stent pre-op, the stenting post-op can be avoided significant number of cases. You agree? Already you mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, Pre-operative yeah. stenting may be more in younger children. You are paper on the mentioned is six years a beautiful point to be noted uh, that all the all the things will change if you less than five years something like that uh, once yeah. they are more than 10 years they are almost they behave they behave almost like adults Correct. Uh, what, Correct. What, uh, sir in uk what uh, lengths of these tents uh, you have all the lengths available in your ot because we use standard 16 centimeter even my paper yeah. in indian journal of urology less than five years is accepted they may, the many of the reviewers has asked uh, why you are telling only 16 centimeters uh, why only 3.5 french in all cases do you yeah. use different type of sizes and lengths so we have uh, so because pediatric patients come in a range so yeah. like i did two cases on monday we used for one we used 4.2 20 centimeter okay and okay. for the other we used 4.7 and i think it was 24 centimeter because it was slightly big Yes. Sometimes, if it's like a proper adult, some 16-year-old are like adults, you know, you know, they're yeah. tall and big. Yeah. Although they're 16 in age, they are like they're normal adults. Like they're adults. correct. So there, I wouldn't hesitate using a six French 28. So I, 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 I don't think it depends. So I mean, we know that from from studies that the size of stent doesn't really matter in terms yeah. of the dilatation. Yes. 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 And, so uh, I think whatever you are comfortable with is fine. Yes. Well, my, my observation, majority of the children less than five years in RIRS get uh, evening uh, low-grade fever. Uh, 
nearly 40 percent was in my paper but next same continuing same antibiotic it disappeared next day afternoon so i rarely discharge on the same day i'm always afraid you also mentioned that they will be coming from distant places uh, yeah. If they are from your local native, uh, local place, uh, what about you uh, You doing a pediatric RIRS as daycare surgery? So, so we have done it. I think that the thing with pediatric patients is the degree of compensation. Yeah. You know, if they decompensate, they go down very quickly. Yes. So yeah. I don't yeah. think there is, you know, there is no merit in doing, can it be done? Yes, it can be done. I have done it. Is it necessary to do it in all cases? There is no proof, no. point to prove. Great. You can easily keep them overnight, you know, and you can send them. If they are like adults, you know, 15, 14, 15, 16, okay. then you can do it. But in younger kids, purely because if they get an infection, suddenly they decompensate they if they are a little bit distant. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Great answer. Sir, do you do RGP at the end of the procedure? Uh, or not necessary if you have cleared single stone, upper upper calyx or middle calyx, you know that everything is cleared, no, because the PCS is small and you, you can easily visualize. Uh, generally, RGP at the end is not required, I, I, I feel. Uh, do you do you do RGP at the beginning or at the end? So, I don't do it at the beginning. I do it at the end and I'll tell you why. Yeah. The reason is, I know that I have checked the calyces. Yeah. If you do an RGP and then you follow the calyx, you know, so you walk the calyx effectively one, one, one. and keep a picture. Yeah. If there is a recurrence in five months, six months, one year, it's easy to say we walked the calyx, it was fine. Unless you're recording every case and keeping it in the file, which is not possible. So I do it so that if there is a recurrence or let's say there was something which is just outside the pelvic calyxal system. Then you can say, look, we've been there this, because they will always say there is a stone, there is a stone. There is. But if you have done the, if you have walked the calyx, then you can say, no, we have done it. And actually, uh, there is no stone. Or if there is a recurrence, you can say there is a genuine recurrence rather than because you missed it. Sir, uh, uh, in, in, in children, do you think that metabolic, apart from the metabolic part, for example, if you leave a small stone like 2 mm, it is a chance because you make powder, pop dusting, some stone may stick to the mucosa, you may not be able to catch it, naturally they will fall. I have seen in children, as you said, falling rate, I mean drop the stones and then they pass through the ureter. Do you think that they grow faster and they come again and again back? What is your experience? For example, you operated at 3 years. Uh, if they follow at around 12 years, majority of the parents concern is how often I have to come and uh, do they recur fast? Uh, what is your opinion, sir? I mean, practically. So, so, so I think in pediatric, almost 50%, if not more, have got some sort of underlying problem. It could be metabolic, it could be functional, it could be anatomic problem. So I do think that the recurrence rate as such is slightly higher in pediatric patients. Pediatrics, yeah. Not in all cases, but if you were to take 100 pediatric patients, let's say 50 or 60, have they got some sort of issue by that, you know, math, there will be a higher recurrence rate. Yeah. So, I, I, so I think they do need to be followed up for longer and they do need a closer follow-up compared to adults because they can't self-present. They can't say I've got pain. Sometimes, yes. you, you know, you have to keep an yes. eye to Silently know. Grow. Yeah. Correct. Uh, Dr. Mohsin has asked a question, micro URS in pediatric cases. I have not uh, heard of it. And micro URS. Is there any micro URS? The smallest scope. There is, there is. Uh, 4 by 6.5. Uh, so, I think in Turkey, in Turkey, they are doing micro URS, if I remember correctly. Uh, but the concept is exactly the same. It's minimizing the size of the scope to gain access. I have no experience, so I can't comment on it. But uh, I think the, the only place I know... 4 by 6.5 digital retroscope. World's smallest is 7.5 flexible retroscope. Correct. Where, correct. where can we go uh, smaller than that if the scope is not available? So I think, again, I'm not, I don't know about it, but I think what that is, it is like a catheter with a, you know how you have the micro PCNL, micro then PCNL. you have the, yeah, it's a similar concept, but I'm not sure how much you can do with that, but I have yes. no, no experience. In it. Even I don't know about it. Uh, uh, generally, uh, it's a, it's a theoretical question. Like first visit when you, when you will call, uh, and then, uh, uh, it's said that after the stone clearance only, we have to do metabolic workup. A comment on this. 
it logically it makes sense because let's say when they have a stone they might have a, some degree of infection or they might have got you know the kidneys may not be working as efficiently because it's the stone is blocking so logically it makes sense and then you also have the advantage of a stone analysis if it's a steel stone then you know exactly what you're looking for so it makes sense to do the analysis after the stone clearance yeah uh, sir you have done ex- uh, too much ex- uh, research on stent and uh, i will ca- ask couple of questions and then we'll close the session uh, sure. stent if you are if you are placing a stent uh, what day it becomes really a source of uh, bacteria and because we feel 10th day is i feel once it is more than a week or 10 days uh, yeah. if you gets fever most of the times if you remove the fever will come down Uh, that that's so, the standard teaching that the bacteria will settle on the and then biofilm and correct. then releasing. Is correct. it true? Correct. Says same or you have observed anything more than that? So we have done some uh, basic science work on stents. Yes. And yes. similar to catheters, by day seven, most stents are also colonized. Colonized. So there is biofilm and there is colonization of the stent. Yeah. The only difference is sometimes some patients, depending on the pre-op urine culture. depending on the underlying you know condition like diabetes or whether they are more prone immunosuppressed etc some yeah. patients are more for uti but as a as a concept the the, the shortest duration of stent as much as possible uh, as uh, you said uh, honest question honest answer i am expecting that there is a uh, um, uh, like in india we use stents of very low cost to be honest hardly 150 rupees there are stents from the bigger companies like cook 700 to 900 rupees there are uh, metallic stents who they say that 5 uh, 3 months I, i even even silicon catheter as a matter of fact with your experience we wanted to know that uh, do you think that uh, the rate of the bacteria growing on these foreign bodies do it really change because of the quality of catheter and the stent I, I think there is some there is some merit in that if you are leaving a, a silicon stent, like for example, if you have a silicon catheter or a latex yeah. catheter, yeah. there is much higher chances of the latex catheter becoming encrusted in the end or becoming encrusted quicker. Yeah. So the material does make a difference. The question is, why do you need it? If you need it just as a post-op, do you really need a very expensive one, or do you, can any stent do? Yes. or have you, do you need it because the patient will come back in 6 week like for example in uk the waiting times are very variable sometimes it could yeah. be a few weeks it could be many weeks many months sometimes so if it is that then you do want a better quality stent so that the rate of infestation biofilm or or you know is as low it will still happen but is lower than a cheaper stent but if it's a post op short duration i don't think it matters maybe the quality of life they will feel a bit more but then it's a cost economic benefit you know what cost do you have and what benefit are you getting from that sir last question uh, again related to your uh, work and uh, how you follow them so in, in the system in uk in educational system you are the chief for the pediatric urology you do a case today you have done certain metabolic evaluation uh, today you don't know what study you are doing after 6 months things may change how do you enter the data so that at one point of time the retrospective can be analyzed prospectively and can continue the data is one question sub question is that who will call the patients is it you or the fellow or the some uh, personnel who does that and how they enter everything is Uh, digital entry or manual entry will be there and uh, where the statistician come on your request or they are part of your team these are all basic questions but out of interest i am asking so that sure. we generate some interest after talking to you uh, i have done 4.4 4 months baby which is reported as a case report i know i have seen it i have seen it uh, yes. the bilateral you are so but everybody said Correct. many people chandramohan you are not in a stage of a case report please do it then i have written luckily indian journal of urology i have put a lot of effort but it was uh, taxing because of lack of uh, some organizational skills that's why i'm asking you this last question sure. how how i will manage? i will i'll take a little bit of time in answering this yeah, please, so sir. the first thing when i when i turned up in southampton 
you know there was no there was no case notes zero i had a sheet of paper all the patients names were there everything is electronic so all the records is electronic what you do the op note is electronic all the results are electronic okay the booking is electronic the patient if they attend the, so apart from so the only thing i maintain on the day is how the surgery went was there an intraoperative complication because that you know but apart from that everything pre op is electronic pre assessment everything you post op is electronic you get it correct so getting data and the other thing i have to say is everything we publish it has to be approved by an audit or a research committee if you don't get the permission then we will be in big trouble so all of it has to be approved by a committee to say why you need to do this okay you need to do it to build new standards of practice or to compare or to improve so you need to have so all the data and there is no patient identifiable data that that leaves so i do a lot of research as well even in the research the the amount of sometimes you feel a bit it's too much but it is for patient safety the amount of paperwork you'll be surprised how much paperwork we have to do to get the research but once you get that then everything is electronic and it's actually very seamless so yeah. today i need to know about something i want to take a data out for i don't know solid trick kidney i put three buttons everything pre post you know it comes out so then analyzing it becomes really easy so i think so, everywhere all the surgeons of uk will map yeah. no no so it is so different hospitals have their own it system they are not linked so i cannot get our it system probably in southampton is ahead compared to some other hospitals but everybody is moving in this direction and i think if you had to invest on one thing if you get to to publish especially in context of india because the volume i am sure is more than the volumes we will see the reason why it's not possible is that is not kept in a organization no, as you say manner it. to harvest it so if you had to invest in something it is that kind of it system that allows you to do that and then everything is prospective because you can't backdate anything you can't backdate a, a, a note you can because it's all done on the day and then whatever happens has happened the so discharge much. somebody and so on yeah exactly so there is no chance of you going back to alter anything because it's all done as it happens yes okay so a lot of manpower is involved and only few persons will work more hard in this like what you are doing okay, sometimes it takes nights also sometimes it takes yeah. nights yeah i think uh, my colleagues always tease me so when i come home i take a short nap and then shweta my wife she is watching is some indians or some english soap i am watching with her but i'm also doing the work so she knows i am watch so you have to multitask in some way to make sure the family is happy you multitask sir because i used to remember one professor dr hemal sir uh, when he was yeah. in aims night when he used to go to his house at 11 all journals will be on the floor he will be sitting on the floor and then writing on the paper it it, it requires a enormous amount of hard work i must say great yeah, publishing is the, publishing is never easy people never who publish easy. will know that publishing is yeah, never publishing easy is it's never easier easy. it looks easier but it's more difficult yeah, than that and during your mbbs do you have this much idea i don't know which college i just want out of curiosity want to ask where, where you did your mbbs sir So I did my uh, KMC Mangalore Kasturba Medical oh, College. Oh, great! I had no idea. I no I only idea. had lot. I I did study, but lot of fun. I only had this that because in UK when I came in 2000, I had no idea. But in uh, 2003, I thought if I don't start, I will end up being a middle grade somewhere in, in some yes. hospital. Yes. Sir. That's when the realization came, yes. uh, and that's when I started doing. Yeah. Really great. KMC as such. Uh, will get they develop some communication skills i feel i have a Correct. positive impression about kmc many is true well and they are formal in their talk and they, uh, they it's an high grade uh, medical college in india i mean i'm i'm not biased and i feel I, like even now no i'll now. i'll tell you a secret i'll tell i i grew up in bihar and i had not seen any english movie till then i didn't listen to english songs yeah. when i went to kmc my english was okay but a bit broken but when i went to kmc you have a very wide variety of people from wide different variety. fields of life and then you start and i'm not saying you need to see english movies or english songs but it it builds your personality that you can interact and you can so i think it, it was very helpful in in, so in they, a lot of ways the the way they see the things uh, like uh, mingling with uh, uh, opposite sex talking sensibly uh, uh, looking at the library 
and they all they all import anyway great yeah. sir great to know that you are kmc and a uh, lot of research uh, uh, you have done I wish uh, we will come to you once and see how the system works and uh, i am also now my my aim is to col- collect the data and put it i am looking at the softwares and all that uh, writing one paper is taking one year for us uh, it it's uh, hard uh, needs to learn and learn the things first and learn the bad habits and then relearn uh, thank you very much uh, sparing your valuable time uh, one time i will take again writing up the research and paper uh, in this forum after maybe 6 months like that so that sure. many youngsters will get benefited hundreds of urologists are joining every year they should uh, high time they should realize probably we are doing with private practice but they should realize the importance of that thank you very much little a little bit of time taken from yeah. that would yeah, would go a long way great